Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming, and thank you very much for your patience. We're still trying to resolve a small technical issue, but we're going to give a start to our today's session. I'm Enzo Martelimoya, a PhD student in Karen Nelson's Restoration Ecology Lab at the University of, Mo of Montana. I'm co-organizing this webinar with Laurel Sinwald, a recent PhD graduate from the Yanatombak's Forest Ecology Lab at CU Denver, and Lou DeLoisi, a PhD student in Daniel Ulrich Lab at Montana State University. If you've missed any of the previous installments, you can find the recordings of the talks on our YouTube channel, which I'll leave the link for that and also our website on the chat in a couple of minutes. Before our main speaker today, uh, we're going to start with a, a brief announcement from our executive direct director, Julie Schummer, which I'm going to introduce now. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Enzo. And thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, I am the executive director of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this year's conference and think if I can share a screen, Enzo. Mm -hmm. One second. Okay. So our there conference you. this year is going to be at Anthony Lake Ski Resort in Eastern Oregon. And so this is our website. You can find this information on the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation website, um, which is whitebarkfound.org. Um, and it's under news and events and then under conferences, this year's conference over here. Um, so the conference is going to be September 19th and 20th, and it's at Anthony Lakes Mountain Resort in Oregon. And we're currently looking for presenters um, and people to, to people to give talks and uh, have posters for the conference. So if you are interested in presenting at the conference this year, um, go ahead and get in touch with Teresa Lorenz. She's, um, we have a, a conference team in Oregon that is organizing the conference and Teresa Lorenz is in charge of putting together the, the presentations. So go ahead and send her your title and short description or your proposed, um, for your proposed talk or poster. Um, so those, she would like those by April 1st. And so the conference is going to be, um, the presentations are going to be on the 19th. And then depending on how many presentations we have, they may extend into the 20th. And then on the 20th, we're going to have a field trip at Anthony Lakes. Um, and Anthony Lakes has done a lot of white bark pine restoration work. They worked with the Forest Service over there to um, do some planting, I believe, and some other work. They have some educational signs and things up as well. So we'll get to go out and see that, which uh, should be really interesting. And let's see, uh, Anthony Lakes is near, it's between Baker and LaGrande, Oregon. Um, so you wanna go ahead and check out what your drive would look would look like um, to see about getting there. Um, let's see, if anybody has questions about that, I can go ahead and put the link uh, in the chat box whenever I'm off here. So you guys can take a look at this information. Um, registration for the conference, we're going to get that up on our website, and that will be uh, probably end of April, sometime in May, um, but we'll send out information in the email newsletter um, when, the, when the registration is up, and folks can start getting registered. And let's see. I also um, want to thank our webinar team today, because um, so Laura, Lou, and Enzo have done a great job of getting um, webinar presenters for the webinar. You can find that information on that same link under news and events on our website. Um, current webinar series info is here. And then if you have missed any of the webinars, um, this past webinar link, that links to our YouTube page. So you can go through and listen to any of these great webinars that you've missed. Um, and there's a bunch of them from the last three years. Um, so, Check those out, share with people, and always get in touch if you have questions. Thanks, everyone. All right, welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay, it is my pleasure to now introduce uh, our today's speaker, Mike Gizzi. Mike is one of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation's board members and the current Ski Area Partnership Committee chair. 
He has a degree in forest resource management from West Virginia University and began his forest service career in 1980 as a volunteer on the Kootenai National Forest in Libby, Montana. His relationship with forest management allowed him to work in the private forest products industry in both Montana and Florida, and also worked for many years as a seasonal worker for the Forest Service until he got his position as a forest silviculturist for the Kootenai National Forest, where he retired from in 2016. Within his career, Mike also cultivated more than 20 years of experience as a certified tree climber, where he had the opportunity to serve as a trainer, as well as the Region 1 Tree Climate Technical Advisor in 2014. During his many years working as a tree climber and silviculturist, Mike has always been intrigued with Weibark Pine, volunteered to promote his species, and also helping design vegetation management projects to promote the recovery of Weibark Pine. So if anyone has any questions for Mike, please type them into the shot or virtually raise your hand at the end of his talk to enable you to set uh, your microphone. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks, Enzo. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to give you the lowdown on the White Bark Pine Friendly Skiria Certification Program that the foundation has had in place uh, since about 2015. Um, I believe that's about right, right before I started on the board. I've been on the board since 20, fall of 2016. So I will get started with my presentation. All right, uh, great quote that's very appropriate to uh, educating people about white bark pine that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they've never experienced. So my white bark pine story, I, as Enzo mentioned, I retired from the Forest Service, oh, she's six, seven years ago now, tree climber and uh, tree climbing instructor. Um, involved in a lot of white bark pine restoration efforts and I'm the committee chair for the uh, ski area partnership committee and I've been a ski patroller at our local Turner Mountain volunteer patroller for 25 plus years. So uh, this presentation um, I've used a version of it um, I presented at the uh, Intermountain Ski Area Association conference annual conference last June in um, in Utah, um, Snowbird, uh, a bunch of ski areas that are in that association gather every year. And so I had the chance to present to a number of them. Um, so this presentation has some information about white bark pine and I'll kind of cruise through that kind of quick since I think most of you know a bit about white bark pine, but bear with me But before I get into the specifics of the certification program. So again, some of this is basic. Um, Five needle pine, long lived, high elevation. It's a keystone species, obviously, um, creating some habitat for other vegetation. Um, it's in serious decline, listed as threatened by the Forest Service or the Fish Wildlife Service. And depends how you look at it. December 22, January 23 was actually signed. Clark's Nutcracker plays a huge role in dispersing that species. Um, Let's see. So, um, again, more basic shrub-like uh, growth, and you know, in the extreme environments, and like this one on the picture to the right, that's at the top of Lookout Pass ski area that's right on the border of Montana and Idaho. And that was the only white bark I found up there. I didn't scour real heavily, but um, and it was kind of tricky to tell that one from the lodgepole pine and dug further growing nearby, but those upswell branches, classic kind of a uh, white bark look for the more tall straight trees that we see occasionally. Habitat and range, you know, and habits over 80 million acres in Western North America, 70% is in the US and of that 90% is on public lands. Higher ranges of the Pacific States, BC, 
throughout the Rocky Mountains of the U.S. and Canada. And there's a lot of ski areas that operate in white bark pine country uh, and that provides a great opportunity for outdoor recreationists to uh, get close to this tree. Some of the landscape benefits, retain snowpack, creates, it helps to create a long ski season. Uh, this year uh, around here, we have very, very little snow. So uh, keeping what we have is even that much more important. Uh, stabilizes soil. Um, can reduce avalanche hazards by becoming anchors in that snowpack. And of course, they produce those big, large seeds that lots of wildlife depend on. Ecological threats, blister rust, mountain pine beetle, and altered fire regimes, uh, and the, uh, the effects of climate change on all of those. Conservation status. 325 million, at least, White Park have died. Uh, you know, in some areas, up to 90% of the trees have, are gone, and we are left with the ghost forests. This picture to the right is at our conference in Stanley a number of years ago, and you can see those all dead white bark pine there and some live ones. Uh, Canada listed this tree as endangered under their equivalent of the Endangered Species Act in 2012. Um, we were a little slower to come around. To that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, it's listed in the U.S. just recently. Some of the restoration efforts, um, obviously, some of them I think are obvious, you know, reducing competition, give them some more resources so they can fight the beetle and the rust. Um, try to protect those trees that are show trees that are alive. If they're alive in a sea of dead and we know they might, they might be really lucky or most likely they've got some genetic traits um, that might be useful. Um, short film. Our pine is facing an unprecedented person. As more than 200 million trees have died due to disease, pests, and climate change. So, experts are working on a plan to save this important tree and all the benefits that lies in the environment and humans. This plan includes identifying and planting seeds from genetically disease resistant and preparing trees, collecting seeds from various locations to preserve genetic diversity. Planting in areas suitable for the future climate. Avoiding damage for insects. Managing forests to reduce fires. White bark pine is now listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Restoration work is underway. But we need to act now to save this keystone species. Our conflict in how we save the white bark Frustration efforts, um, ongoing efforts to identify trees that might have some genetic resistance to those agents that are killing them off. Um, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation has been working with federal and tribal partners to create the uh, National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan. Um, we're trying to raise awareness and funding to protect white bark pine, and that's one of the focus areas of the uh, Scaria certification program. And then the idea is to get some of those genetics out in the landscape in numbers enough to where the Clark's Nutcracker will finish the restoration job by distributing those seeds across the landscape. Um, there's a number of strict restrictions, of course, Endangered Species Act listing. Um, uh, you can't cut, you can't prune, you can't, but you're technically you're not supposed to possess any white bark pine uh, parts or pieces or cones without some documentation. Interesting side note, ESA does not apply to private lands at this time, but states may choose to adopt a policy similar to the Endangered Species Act. Uh, but to my knowledge, that has not been done yet. 
Um, I've got a little sheet um, from Fish and Wildlife Service on um, kind of conservation measures in whiteboard pine management. Um, I kind of called it BMPs, best management practices, but that's not what they called it. Um, and one side note is, you know, ski areas need to manage their vegetation. They've got ingrowth on open slopes that they need to maintain those open slopes for skier safety. They've got tree skiing, again, that they want to keep bigger trees and remove the smaller trees. There's expansion going on. You might have heard about Jackson Hole doing a whole lot of bunch of different projects in their area that uh, are going to affect whitebark pine. Um, and we recognize that as part of the program that that there is going to be some white bark pine being removed from ski areas. And that's kind of the end of the kind of white bark pine basic information. Now I'm going to get into the meat and bones of um, certification program. So it started in 2016 when uh, Whitefish Mountain Resort was the first skier to be certified in the Northwest Montana uh, whitefish area. Um, they've been doing some great white bark pine there for years, educational and management wise. Um, they partner with the Forest Service and assist in uh, cone collection and and uh, other collections like scion and pollen, et cetera. Um, the idea is it's going to increase awareness among uh, skiers and their patrons about white bark pine and its status. And it uh, kind of provides an opportunity for skiers to get directly involved in restoration efforts. And that picture is in 2016 when they first got certified. You might recognize a few folks there. You know, the key to this program is it's the easiest way for most people to see white bark pine. You jump on a ski lift, the bottom of the mountain, you get off on the top and bang, you can be in white bark pine. Doesn't get any easier than that. Many ski areas uh, have white bark pine in the West. Uh, not all for sure. I have a spreadsheet that I started years ago uh, to try to keep track of which ones do and which don't. And I'll show that to you in a little bit. And it's a great access for land managers, uh, Whitefish Mountain and many other areas. Um, you know, they'll give the Forest Service free access to the lift in order to get up to do some work on uh, white bark pine. If it's in the wintertime and, and the same in the summer, if the lifts are operational or oftentimes there's road access two parts of the ski area. Um, I know Whitefish has a number of plus trees that they've been cone collecting on uh, for a number of years. So it's uh, really slick for access because as you know, white bark grows in remote country uh, and access is one of the big limitations on uh, doing any kind of management or cone collection, et cetera. And the goals and motivation of the program really are to recognize ski areas that are you know, leaders in conservation and restoration and education, um, and then to uh, just spread the word. We want to educate the the uh, staff and resort employees as well as the public that are in those areas. Um, more goals and motivation that you know we help those ski areas in their efforts uh, with conservation and restoration. Um, and it provides another way for the ski area patrons to get involved in, in uh, white bark pine restoration. Current skiers, like I mentioned, Whitefish was the first um, to get certified. We only have four in the US right now. Um, Whitefish Mountain, Bachelor, um, Yellowstone Club, and Brundage are all four certified. Um, and then we have a handful that are in the process working towards certification, Mammoth Mountain, June Mountain, in California, Anthony Lakes in Oregon, where a conference is going to be, Sun Valley, Big Sky, Lost Trail. Um, and we have the same program, pretty much same program running in Canada, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada has a very active group working on certification um panorama mountain is certified and um sorcerer lodge a backcountry lodge is certified and they have a number of others that are working towards certification 
And here's so, a Sion Resort. It ended up being in 2016, and correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, the first ski area to be served to actually be certified as a ski area that's friendly to white bark pine and managing white bark pine. What's most critical is that, that it's the right site. The seeds and cones were collected here in 2014 up on Big Mountain. They were collected from the Good Medicine, Tarmac, and Bowl area in the front side as you guys camp the chairlift. Um, the, the seeds, were, the cones were collected from there. And so the seedlings we're going to be planting today will be collected from that year collected. And there's a, there are five elements in that criteria that the mountain would have to pass to get that certification. Remember, they were certified in 2016. So um, the five emphasis areas are conservation, education, we have actual management, active management, restoration, and research. So those are the five things. Whitefish mountain. Right. Certification requirements. That was Carl Anderson from the Flathead National Forest mentioning the same thing. Education, conservation, management, restoration, and research are the kind of the categories. Under education, we want to educate the resort employees and the public. You know, we want those resort employees, especially those out in the field um, doing some sawing, uh, glading, tree work to know what a white bark pine looks like and what they're supposed to do when they encounter one. Uh, of course, all that's changed now that it's listed. Um, they can't do anything without prior approval. Um, we'd like them to name, uh, label at least one uh, white bark pine on their slopes so that the public can see one for real and know what they look like or at least have an idea. Uh, we have this poster like the one that's to the right here that the foundation created, general educational information. Um, we also just, we got a grant um, a year ago and uh, Julie and Tio and I um, created a, an interpretive sign for ski areas that I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, again, it's all about education. Um we want them to incorporate white bark pine information in their educational programs if they have them. And if they don't, we encourage them to start that. Um, some of them have summer programs as well, that that would be a great combination um, to educate the public and their customers. More educational things. Uh, display ski area created coast, uh, poster, offer snowshoe box, um, uh, to talk about white bark pine and, and ecology and conservation efforts. Um, incorporate uh, white bark pine information into summertime guided hikes and to create an outdoor educational display. Conservation, create a white bark pine distribution map. You know, we want them to know where those white bark on their slopes are. So when it does come time to expand or, or uh, move a lift or put a new lift in, they know where their white bark are and they can do their best to avoid them. Um, incorporate a conservation plan into resort management um, and their expansion plans. And again, we just want them to do it wisely. If they're going to expand, you know, do their best to avoid white bark, especially cone bearing white bark. Um, but that all has to go through, if they're on public land, that has to all go through Fish and Wildlife Service now that it's listed. Um, a really interesting example, Yellowstone Club, which you might know is a private ski resort in Montana, and it's all on private land, and they just got certified as white bark friendly. Um, they've done some fantastic work with white bark, um, fuels reduction, transplanting few, uh, trees out of slopes that they would otherwise cut. They hand dug over 300 white bark pine and moved them to an area that they wouldn't need to be cut in the future. Uh, with with mixed success, and they did some monitoring in order to determine maybe some of the best, best methods to do that. Um, and again, they're in private land, so they don't need to they don't need to conform to uh, Endangered Species Act. But I think it's a real highlight for them that they their forester, their Jeff Cadry, um, uh, is a real champion of white bark and uh, has done just a great job up there. Um, and then we want to develop a monitoring plan. It doesn't have to be super formal. 
Um, but we just want to gauge what's going on with the white bark on there uh, within their ski area uh, boundary. Management, restoration, and research. Um, we want them to actively manage uh, one or more of the following kind of options, you know, protect large white bark pine from uh, mountain pine beetle attack, which uh, you may know would be the uh, uh, verbenone uh, packets that is one way to do that. Um, pruning white bark or white bark, white pine blister rust infected trees, you know, that's an effective method of removing the rust from trees uh, is by pruning them, depending on where the canker is, uh, reduce fuels around white bark. Identify suitable sites for planting somewhere that they don't plan to ever expand into, maybe protected area, what area that skiers don't have access to. Make that their their center for white bark pine and and uh, do some good work in there, rather than out in their slopes where they uh, are just going to trees are probably going to grow up and be in the way in the future. Agree to host plus trees, um, and agree to uh, host uh, ecology study or long term monitoring project with research partners. And all this, if you're on federal land, it's all pretty easy because the mountain really doesn't have to do that much. Um, since it's federal land, the, the feds are going to manage that piece of ground in conjunction with the ski resort, but um, it's pretty easy for them. It's generally, we tried to do it this way to make it fairly easy to get certified. It doesn't, we don't, don't want it to be too daunting. And then the benefits of certification, recognition as a leader, environmental stewardship. Uh, by leading the way in white bark pine, you know, kind of toot your own horn they've, if they've been doing good work. We we help them get that word out. Uh, we supply certification plaque, a sign, a poster, um, and we help and we do some media promotions. Um, and we provide all kinds of guidance on white bark pine education, conservation and management as well. And we help, uh, we provide education and outreach materials. Um, some of the support from the foundation, you know, we're a good resource for information and education and training. We'll go to the area and, and do a presentation to their staff and or the public, do an evening presentation um, for some of their customers, um, just to educate them on the basics of white bark pine and its importance. Um, we'll help them, of course, through the whole certification process. Um, and then we maintain a link to the ski area on our website and they do the same vice versa. And so that is the end of that presentation. Um, and let me show you a couple of the things I talked about here. Uh, This is our the sign that we created um, through a grant. There we go. Mike, yes. one second. Um, I recommend you to stop sharing and sharing again because you're okay. only sharing your presentation screen. Okay. Can you see the sign now, preserving powder, protecting the summit? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. So the sign was actually very challenging because we had to be short and sweet, uh, thinking that this is going to be on the top of a mountain ski area. People are going to be obviously dressed in ski gear and goggles and probably aren't going to want to stand around and read a, a really long in-depth sign. So it was really a challenge to keep it short and sweet because there's so much information uh, that we would like to get across. Um, but this is what we came up with. Um, we were pretty happy with it. Uh, they are getting, we got a grant to print about five of them. They're very expensive with shipping. They're close to $2,000 a piece, um, but they're made of some real high quality material that's made for the outdoors and extreme environments and they don't fade for many, many years. So, um, we're going to be excited to get those out. Um, 
Yeah. And okay, the bottom right, see that blank area? That's where the ski area logo would go next to the foundation logo. And then if they're on Forest Service land, then the Forest Service logo would go next to that as well. Oh, and this is my spreadsheet of um, of all the ski areas. And it may not be complete, but I, I don't know if you can see the tabs at the bottom. This is Washington. Yeah, Mike, we have the same, the same thing okay, with, same with thing. this one, too. <laughs> Copy. Apologize for my lack of ability. Zoom. Can you see that? Yes. Right. Okay, <laughs> so there's a spreadsheet, pretty basic. Um, scary name, do they have white bark pine, yes or no? Um, and that, like I said, this may not be complete or totally accurate. Um, the yeses are we've got confirmation on for sure. Washington, Idaho, et cetera, et cetera. So I would ask, participants today if anybody has a favorite ski area that uh has white bark pine that they would uh, be interested in helping them get certified um or just want to connect me with them um or if you know someone that works at the resort kind of breach that topic uh i'd be glad to talk to them meet with them uh make a presentation what have you um, to get more ski areas involved. It's been kind of a slow process. Uh, some ski areas were a little nervous before ESA that somehow uh, being certified and, and doing a conservation plan would limit their ability to expand or glade runs and that kind of thing. And, and we've tried to emphasize it. No, that's not what we're about. We want you to do it wisely. Know where they are, protect the cone bearings, trees as much as possible. Um, but just do it wisely. And, uh, I think that is all I have. I'd love to answer any questions if anybody has. And my, um, my email is mike.gc. I could put it in the chat at whitebarkfound.org. Thank you very much, Mike, for your presentation. That's really informative. We do have a couple of questions for today. Um, the first one is directed by Greg Benito, and it says, as this or will this program be expanded to ski areas with limber pine or other five needle pines? That's a great question. And I, yes, absolutely. Um, I know the foundation, you know, we expanded our sort of focus from white bark only to all high, high elevation white, uh, white pines. And so, yes, we haven't done that yet, um, but it, it certainly would fit. Same things would work for those other species. So thanks for that, Greg. Thank you, Mike. The next one comes from Jessica Mann and it says, can a ski area post this poster or this uh, educational display if they are in the process of getting certified or have to wait until they, until they get certified to put it up? Um, the wording in that sign says you are at a very special place, a white bark pine friendly ski area. So the way it's designed right now is they need to be certified in order to display the sign. Um, now we had a ski area bridger in Montana that doesn't have very many white bark pine. Um, and they were interested in maybe displaying the sign. Um, and we're going to work with them. And to try to make that work. Um, we're hoping that they'd be interested enough to get certified, but I think their concern is they don't have very many white bark pine. Um, but then the dilemma is, well, maybe they're that much more important um, since you don't have very many. Um, but certification isn't that difficult. So we'll work with them and we can always, the sign is ours. We had a a contractor that helped us, an interpretive contractor that helped us design and and, and do the wording and the art with that. Um, but we own it now, and so we can change um, the wording and stuff. And so we would we would work with areas because we just want to get the educational piece out there. That's that's the bottom line. 
But at this time, it's it's brand new, so we haven't done any of that, but we would certainly be open to that. Oh, sorry, I was muted. There is another question coming from Marnie D.C. Holt that says, does this certification apply in Canada as well? Yes. Yeah, Canada has the same program um, that they're running. Um, so, yes, same thing. Canada is working hard. They've got a lot of areas that are working towards certification, but they only have two that are certified right now. But they've got a whole bunch um, that are working towards certification. And, you know, like I mentioned with Bridger, they have very few white bark pine, and you get into some areas like Big Sky or um, Mammoth. Um, I, I think in some, some places you can't hardly take a step without stepping on a white bark pine. So you've got this extreme differences that look out pass in Idaho, Montana border. They have very few, um, I, like I said, I only saw one. So, um, I don't know. I think they, maybe they take on a little bit different importance when you have very few compared to when you have a lot, but bottom line is, are there any healthy ones? Um, and that's, the, that's where we need to focus. Nice. Thank you. There is another question here that says, um, just wondering, uh, this one is from John Barley. It says, representation, Mike, um, just wondering if any work or discussion has been done to educate backcountry user groups and whether these signs could be possibly modified uh, for trailhead signs. Yeah, we would love to do that. Uh, we haven't done anything with um, backcountry groups to date. Um, but that um, ski area or the backcountry area in Canada that I mentioned, um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, 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 anyways, um, they they fly in. I think you fly in, stay at the hut, and backcountry from there. And, and they were they were the first in Canada to get certified. Sorcerer Lodge is what it's called. But no, but that's something that we've had the thought of, John. Thanks for bringing that up. Is um, it'd be great to get some of this, this kind of uh, educational information at a trailhead or along a trail. Um, it gets a little sticky with forest service. Um, it took us a long time to get approval to put these signs up at some of the areas that are on forest service land. It's just red tape, I think. Um, but there is a process there. Um, and that might be a little tricky, but that's something we, we definitely have on the radar. Thank you, Mike. I have a question regarding also how can uh, uh, anybody like incorporate or suggest one of these areas? Uh, I'm asking this because I'm aware that there is, um, I'm not quite sure whether it's in ski resort, but at the least it's an area that has a tramp uh, for access in the Wallowa Whitman National Forest nearby Joseph, where people can go up the mountain. And there are some interpretative uh, trails and some displays as well, but I'm not well aware whether how would be the process there. So if I were to propose that area, what type of contact would I have to get before getting them to you? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. What kind of, uh, just working with the foundation? So like which person's contact would I have to get uh, and send them to you? Would it have to be the manager or who would be the person to talk to uh, to propose them the, the the program? Oh, that's always a tough one um, because I, what I've run into is you, you'll you um, find somebody that's interested, has some knowledge about white bark pine that's a little lower on the uh, pay scale than, than some of the other folks at the resort. And, and those folks are interested in it, but once it goes up the, up the, uh, the line, um, to more of the managers of the ski area, it sometimes it stops there, just doesn't go any further. So the higher you can get in the organization, the better. It seems like marketing people um, are oftentimes who we work with, um, as well as operations, uh, kind of the uh, either general manager or ops managers for the ski areas are seem to be the best contact. But any way you can kind of get in the door and um, uh, spread the word, educate them a little bit, 
and certainly with the recent listing that's helped um, kind of raise the awareness of everybody about white bark pine, right? All right, and we have time for one last question, but any other questions or suggestions or comments can be addressed directly to Mike or you can just send it to us and we'll forward them to him later. The last question is comes from Matthew Brophy. It says, if there is seed collecting as part of this program, where does the seed go? Uh, are they propagated or long-term storage? Um, you know, that's all part of the, um, at least the stuff on federal land. It's all coordinated by the Forest Service or the BLM or whoever the federal agency is. Uh, the Forest Service case, um, those seeds go to the nursery, whatever their local nursery is. It's to probably Coeur d'Alene or... Um, uh, Darina in Oregon, um, where then those geneticists take it from there and, and they're the ones that will, you know, do the rust screening and, and that kind of thing to determine if there is uh, some resistance in those trees um, to know whether they're um, kind of a fit for a restoration. Um, so no, they don't store them because we don't know if they've got genetic resistance, uh, at least in the initial plantings. I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the initial collections. Once that tree's been tested and if it's confirmed to have some genetic resistance, then more collections happen. They cross those trees with other trees that have um, a different type of resistance, test those offspring, and then the, the product of those, um, if it uh, uh, has good resistance, then those go into operational plantings. So it's, it's quite a process. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for your presentation today. And uh, without further ado, I wanted to remind everybody that we're still in the process of determining what is going to happen with our next session in March. But the next confirmed webinar will be on April 16th with Sean Hoy Skuvik presenting his work on responses of white bark pine to abiotic stress implications of physiology across scale. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thanks again, Mike, for your presentation, and we hope to see you soon. Have a good week. Thanks, everybody.